All right, welcome to Wealth Cartel, where hindsight's a motherfucker. Our mission is to stop people saying, I wish I had to listen and to help people capitalize on everyone else's mistakes before making them themselves. In summary, our tagline says it all, turn our hindsight into your foresight. So we're just a couple of lads from the west and the central coast who grew up without really any wealth around us and used it to motivate us to make something of ourselves. Uh, along the way, mainly as we matured, we did a lot of things right, but more importantly, we made a lot of mistakes. A lot of mistakes that could have been avoided by not being know-it-alls and actually listening to what others had told us instead of thinking, no, not me. So my name's Akko. I'm a, a business, small business owner with a bunch of franchises called Penon Picasso at the moment uh, with large plans of building a large business portfolio. Uh, I'm Kingy. I'm a financial advisor looking to break the mold and what good advice should look like and start teaching people how to enjoy life to the fullest while also planning for tomorrow out of my business, Three Kings Wealth Management. Down here at Bella Vista Hotel, guys. Bella Vista Hotel has got a podcast um, room set up here for everyone to use. It's a great spot. Good little setup for us. Um, nice little backdrop as well, if anyone's seen the backdrop. So, yeah, if, if uh, it looks familiar to you guys, this is Bella Vista Hotel. Get down. Get down here. It's got great food, great drinks, great cocktails, a good little atmosphere, um, not just for the podcast. They so come down for the podcast or come down for a feed and, and check the guys out. Uh, thanks for supporting us. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the episode. All right, guys, welcome to Wealth Cartel Podcast, episode 16. Um, we've got the main man here, Elvis. Uh, Elvis Sinosik, I think that's how I say it. Elvis Sinosik, yep. Sinosik, close. I've got to get these names right. Um, Elvis was a pro, a pro MMA fighter, uh, ex-UFC against some massive names. Uh, looking at his, his, uh, his record, he's, he's quite impressive. Uh, now runs King's Academy down at Moorbank and he's the head of UFC gyms, BJJ Australia. Um, we referred to Elvis because uh, he trains one of our faves that we've had on, uh, Janae Hollowpoint Harding. So, mate, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Pleasure. And uh, as I always like to start these things, it's uh, good to be the king. <laughs> I know. I say that all the time, too. That's what he <laughs> says. That's exactly what he says. Look at this. How good is this? In this background, we've got a king's, two king's logos. We're taking over, I tell you what. The street, technically, one's behind your head. So, <laughs> <That's true. laughs> so you want to move your head across it. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Mate, um, so thanks for coming on. Uh, we really appreciate it. You know, I think um, you've sort of come through the... You were in the UFC era when UFC was quite new in the early days. And I think there's a lot of people who aren't in the industry, industry that, you know, that maybe some of the fanboys and girls that are getting on now that wouldn't know who you are. But anyone who knows, you know, you were a bit of a legend for, for the sport across, across these parts of the waters. You really got in there early and did some big things. So thanks for coming on. We're looking forward to it. Mate, do you want to give us a start off? Intro yourself. Tell us a bit about who you are, where you're from what life was like growing up and how you got to where you are? Yeah, sure. So, um, as mentioned, my name is Elvis Sinisek. I'm known as the King of Rock and Rumble, or King, as my students uh, affectionately like to call me. Uh, I'm luckily one of the pioneers of the sport of mixed martial arts here in Australia. Again, it's not something I plan to do. It's just something that kind of happened uh, back in that era. Um, I grew up in Canberra. Um, was a young ethnic kid, got bullied a little bit, so kind of got into martial arts, did a little bit of judo, a little bit of taekwondo. Um, and then just uh, through the years, went to school, to university, degree, got a degree in computing, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then once I graduated, um, I started working full time and I caught up with one of my old uh, high school friends who, were, who we both did martial arts at the time. And he introduced me to the UFC on a little VHS tape. And I went, what wow, number was that? What number UFC was that, you reckon? Uh, I think it was number two. <laughs> so it was either one or two. I, I can't remember. It was either UFC one or two. It was, uh, so back in the 90s, he gave me a you should look into this. And I went, oh, this is awesome. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start training. So I did martial arts until I kind of got to university. Then I stopped because I got busy. Then I actually started playing volleyball, started playing pro beach volleyball and eventually ended up moving up to Sydney because of the martial arts and the pro beach. But back to the story. So he gave me this tape. So I started training. I looked for a school. I found a Bruce Lee school, which was teaching Jun Fan, which had stick fighting, Muay Thai and a little bit of Jiu Jitsu. Um, just because I wanted to do something that kind of covered those ranges because I'd seen this UFC tape. Um, and Bruce Lee was kind of what inspired me in the early days to kind of get into martial arts training. Uh, started training, ended up moving to Sydney, found a jiu-jitsu school, Anthony Lange, who became uh, my coach. Um, started doing that, jiu-jitsu, shoot fighting. Uh, then the Blitz magazine came out with an ad, do you want to be an ultimate fighter? And I'm like, hell yeah. So I applied for it. And it's a long story, but I eventually ended up fighting. So 
Were you the first Australian on the UFC roster? Sorry? Were you the first person from Australia on the UFC roster? Yes, so I'll actually go through it now. I was the first, um, I fought in the first ever MMA event here in Australia. Um, I won the first ever uh, Australian heavyweight title. Um, I was the first Australian to fight in the UFC. I was the first Australian to fight for a world title. Sadly, didn't win it, so I can't claim that record. Um, I was the first Australian to fight, uh, compete at the ADCC Submission Wrestling World Championships in the inaugural year. Um, for those who are aware of the sport, I was the first person to uh, submit someone with a heel hook submission in ADCC competition. So um, a lot of firsts in there at the time was just doing whatever I was able to do to, to kind, of, kind of keep moving forward. It was more about uh, the personal challenge, uh, the desire to kind of compete and test myself and to kind of see where I was going. Uh, in hindsight, I kind of look back and it's kind of a very crazy time. And it's, I look back and I'm like, wow, you know, um, the things I did back then, um, I guess I, you could never have planned it. So, yeah, <laughs> the right place, the right time for a lot of things. I saw on there, um, I saw on there that you've got uh, the Pancrase event on your record as well. Did That's you, correct. Did you, uh, Pancration took a big swing in Australia a couple of years ago. I had a lot of mates going doing a lot of the Pancration tournaments. Yeah. Did you have a big, um, uh, sorry, what was that, Dan? What's Pancration? Pancration's what it was when it was in the Olympics way back when. That's what we're essentially fighting started, was the Pancration tournaments way, way back when. Pancration is quite, well, back, yeah, like you said, back in the day, Pancration was what MMA is today. Uh, today, the Pancration events are a little bit different. They're more of an amateur-style, yeah. open mat MMA with a little bit, a few more rules in place, kind of designed for the amateurs. There is also um, an event called Pancrase, That's which is kind of separate to Pancration, yeah. but the name comes off yeah. Pancration. So um, I was involved a little bit with Pancration, mainly just because um, I had students competing in it. I think I did a couple of events back in the day when it was um, around. Um, I competed in the Pancras event in uh, Japan. I commentated the Pancras uh, Australian event. So, yeah, I've been kind of, in, I've had my finger in, in pretty much anything to do with that uh, MMA or MMA, MMA related here in Australia. Back in the day, it was known as No Holds Barred and then there was yeah. Pancration and different names. Now it's kind of all evolved to kind of come under one umbrella, which is MMA, uh, for those that don't know, is mixed martial arts. And it's just the combination of different martial arts. It's not any particular combination. It is just the proving ground where all different martial arts can come together and test themselves um, against each other. And it's kind of evolved into its own system of a, a striking, wrestling, grappling system altogether. It's, um, I'm a bit disappointed to see the hair's a normal colour today, to be honest with you. I'm sorry. I, I, I slept in, didn't have time to bleach it. You know what it's like. And it's uh, the Thursday. What the fuck's going on here? What's what's going going on? colour your hair? You cut out, Dan. What'd you say? I said post what, 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 he say something? Yeah, Dan cut out. Um, what, um, what, what's, the, what's the go with the coloured hair? Uh, back in the day... Um, so when I was competing in jiu-jitsu tournaments back in the day, I, I did stupid stuff. Like I used to paint my toenails and stuff to put my opponents off and that kind of transitioned into painting my toenails and colouring my hair. And um, so over the years competing in the UFC, I've, had, I've shaved my head. I've had uh, red hair. I had green and gold hair. I've had blonde hair. Um, I even bleached my goatee and all that sort of stuff. So I just used to do crazy stuff. It was more um, hey, just to fuck so with people them. Do stuff like a lot of competitors have have things like lucky underwear or lucky mouth guards or things like that that they they do all the time. For me, it was about doing something a little bit crazy to kind of get into that frame of mind for competition. So I used to like. I knew that when fight week came up and I was doing whatever I was doing, whether it was colouring my hair, painting my nails, or doing shaving my head, it was like a mental preparation that I'm getting ready to fight. So by the time I took walk, walked into the ring, I'd already started my uh, mental preparation, doing things uh, like um, you get a particular, you get your walkout song, uh, in particular if you know what it's going to be in advance. So every time I used to drive the training. I'd play that, that my walkout song just over and over and over in the car until I got there. Then as soon as I get there, I turn it off. 
because you don't want to listen to it. Now you train, now you focus. And that's the same thing as like you listen to it as you're walking out to the ring or cage. And then as soon as you get there, it turns off and then you've got to switch on. So that was just, just one of the, the different things I did for psychological or mental preparation for my matches. In a psychological I, I love that. I think mean, that's mad. That's fucking, that's sick. I'd, I'd do something like that as well, I think, just to get prepared. I think it's a mad idea. Yeah, I'd, look, I'd, I'd shave my head like Homer Simpson just to put them off. <laughs> Two strings. <laughs> um, so, Elvis, it's, um, you know, you've, had a, you've had quite the journey. I'm interested to hear a bit about, you know, uh, the computing degree. What was the what was the change, or what was the point in your life where you changed from you know you you were travelling down that normal route essentially, you know, going to uni, doing whatever, and you completely left hooked it across into um into the world during now. What was the big turning point for you there? What was the big steps that you took, or the mind frame that you sort of built to to make that change and take that leap? Well, it's it's a kind of convoluted story, so I'm going to kind of do my best to to cover all the points. So as I mentioned. Um, when I was growing up, I was just trying to find something that um, I enjoyed and I was good at. Um, and as a kid, I kind of had a bit of an affinity. So when I was younger, I had an affinity for maths and stuff. So I did well, but I didn't enjoy it. So okay. I was one of those kids that would get a, an A mark and a D for effort. And, um, and so when I kind of got to uni, I wanted to find something that I enjoyed. And when I was at High school, I enjoyed computer work, you know, just playing on the computers. Obviously, kids play computer games, and I'm like, you know what, wouldn't mind working with computers. So that just seemed like the, the easiest thing to kind of do at the time. And, well, oh, gone, back. Nah, back, sorry, boys. I don't know what happened. Yeah, it's just me and you at the moment. No, no, I'm here. I can oh, you're you. still here? All right, well, yep. I'll keep going then. Um, so I, I kind of decided uh, computing would be my career. Did it uh, in high school, moved into university, and obviously. Sorry, were, were you fighting by this stage much? No, 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 no. So back then, I was um, doing just um, martial arts. I was doing martial arts training. Yeah. But I wasn't fighting. Like I was competing in jujitsu competitions or things like that, uh, but not actually fighting. I didn't actually start fighting until um, after I graduated. Moved to Sydney, started working. So I've worked uh, for some of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, in, when I was in Canberra for AusAid and the Commonwealth Department of Public Prosecution, so obviously government being Canberra. When I moved to Sydney, I worked for Microsoft, Qantas, uh, Colonial State Bank, and then uh, Coopers and Librand, which became PricewaterhouseCoopers. So yeah. during that time, you know, I'm working in IT. I ended up spending about 10 years in the IT. Um, moved up to Sydney because I wanted to play professional beach volleyball and do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and then through the Jiu Jitsu I discovered uh, the MMA. So I was playing pro beach and then discovered this MMA or no holds barred back in the day. And then I started kind of took a dive into the into the um, the MMA and I was it was quite um, exciting. Obviously it was brand new. No one else was doing it. I had a martial arts background, so it was a kind of a Did natural. BJJ get really big when Hoist Gracie and stuff came on the scene in Australia? Did you No, know? not at all. Like um, there was John Will who'd kind of uh, discovered it uh, earlier. So he owned a magazine called Blitz. He used to travel around the world training in different martial arts just through his magazine. Um, and this, I can't remember his name. I think it may have been Pedro or something. This Brazilian came over, put a $50,000 challenge to anyone uh, to fight him. So basically he put up 50, you put up 50 and then the winner takes all. So John Will's like, oh, you know, I've fought in the, he was a Salat world champion. He'd gone to India, wrestled in the pits of India and done things like that. And he's like, oh, this sounds interesting. But he's a smart man. So he's like, you know what? I'm not going to just dive in. I'm going to find out a little bit more about what this guy does, where he comes from. So he actually ended up going to Brazil and, you know, just finding the Gracie brothers and then eventually the Machados who he ended up uh, affiliating with. And um, that's kind of how he brought jiu-jitsu over to Australia. So he was the first one that kind of brought it over as the UFC. Um, was, you know, kind of starting to take form. So by the time I discovered it, John Will had already been doing it for a few years. Um, I think he got in just ahead of uh, Hoist Gracie coming into the UFC because um, the Gracie challenge was already quite well known in Brazil. So they basically challenged any other martial art to a fight and they pretty much came on top all the time. And this Brazilian took that idea and decided to travel around the world so he could make some money. But 
Uh, I'm not sure how successful he was at actually getting people to take up the challenge because it's a lot, lot of money of back then. Put up fifty thousand dollars of your own money. Crazy, that's such a fucking cool story. I I had never ever heard that before. That's unreal. Like I love I love the fight scene in the UFC. And I've never ever ever heard that. That's unreal. That's cool yeah. to fucking hear where it originated and how someone brought it here. Because I mean, you would pick a place like Oz because everyone thinks they can have a crack over here, and you think you look at a little bloke. Oh no, someone come over and said before I knew about MMA, and someone said, "Hey, yeah. put fifty grand up." And we'll have a wrestle. I'm looking at him thinking, uh, I'll do yeah, you. We'll have a, he would have used, we'll have a punch on, you know. It's like, yeah, we'll all go punch on. I punch on at the pub every week. No problem. <laughs> yeah. Let's see what you got. You know, so people forget, people forget on. Aussies are we're a bunch of way back criminals, though. You know what I mean? We're, we're, <laughs> we're convicts. Like, we'll, we'll win. I'm not going to make any strength jokes. So, <laughs> yeah, not, not, not when you're near Liverpool. Let's be careful. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, John, you know, John, you know, John, you know, started training with Langy who was under John Will and that. Um, so yeah, you know, this I discovered this year, decided to uh, start competing and then for a little while I was doing pro beach volleyball and um, the no holds barred. And it kind of for a little while it stagnated because it's just really difficult to get overseas. Like this I got the sport here, I got one or two matches uh, in Japan and then for about two years nothing. Like um, I almost got a couple of matches overseas, but then back then the cost of flights was stupid. You know, it was like $4,000 for an international flight and things like that. So none of the promoters were willing to just fly me out because I was an unknown um, until kind of prices started coming back down, started becoming uh, more affordable. And then when I got the opportunity to start fighting, I kind of came to a point and went, look, I'm okay at beach volleyball. I'm at the, I'm at the like I, I, play, I was playing pro beach, but I was at the bottom of the tier of competitors, you know, you've got all these guys, I'm coming up against kids who've been doing volleyball since they were five years old. I didn't start it till I was like 18. And, you know, so they've been doing it most of their lives. They're, they're six foot six, six foot seven, you know, I was six three. I was an okay height and maneuverability for beach, but I was always going to be a struggle to crack the top. Whereas with the, the MMA, this is something I'd been doing since I was about eight years old. So I've been doing most of my life. Not a lot of people were doing it. So I kind of weighed up the pros and cons. I mean, you know what? I think I'm going to focus on um, the MMA. So I kind of finished off my beach volleyball season, decided to focus on uh, the MMA. And I mean, look, here we are today. Um, owner of one of the largest, most comprehensive MMA facilities in Australia with uh, King's Academy head of UFC Gyms Australia, first Australian in the UFC, and obviously first Australian uh, working along with Richie Bass in the UFC Fight Week on, on Fox Sports, you know, commentating for about four or five years Did as Richie well. Did Richie Bass so. train, out, train out with you? No, no. Um, I knew Richie just through the scene, and I ended up working with him for about four or five years uh, on Fox Sports when we were doing the UFC Fight Week. I would have loved to see a bit more out of Richie, eh? I think his, his career stopped a bit short. I would have loved to see him. Yeah, Talented guy, really super nice guy. We, were, yeah. we got on really well. A party with um, Richie a couple when of times. When he kind of got right. out of the UFC, uh, I know he was keen to kind of um, step in and, and jump in, and I just don't think he ever got the right offer. And, mm. um, you know, shit, uh, he's not over the hill yet, so there's still a chance that, you know, once COVID clears, that maybe we'll see him back, back in again. So, um, as you said, yeah, he you know, had a lot of potential, and I know he was still continuing to pr improve even after uh, he finished his career. Yeah, we had a, we had a, I had a few mates that were, we were that were around that CFC CFC scene for a while, and we he'd commentate a lot, and he commentated three or four of my my best mates' fights, and we'd come down to Cronulla and party with with Richie after every fight. He's a lovely guy. He's um, yeah, he's a nice good, guy. Likes yeah, the party. <laughs> yeah, good dude. He got pretty blind. Don't we all? Don't we all? <laughs> But mate, that's um, that's good to hear. So what we want to do is we want to sort of take, you know, you you've you've built, you've had a journey, a journey and a half, and you've done some things and you've you've learned some lessons, I'm sure, along the way. So we want to try and pull a little bit of that out. Um, I think we'll we'll go into things a bit more specific in a minute. But sort of to start, what if you could look back on sort of your journey, and I'm sure yeah. you probably talk about this with a lot of your your athletes that come through, which is, I know Janae said half the half the benefit of being with you is that you've got a lot of insights into the world. Um. But if you look back on your journey, what, what is a, a key moment or point that you, you would love, you can pinpoint and go back that really um, you could go back and talk to yourself and give yourself some advice around maybe getting ahead quicker or maybe, or maybe you did it right. You'd go back and say, yeah, that's the right path. What, what's a real key turning point in your life that you can pinpoint? 
<sighs> Look, I think um, if I could go back, um, what I would change is um, being a little smarter about taking fights. Back in the day, as I said, for me, it was, um, all, it was about the challenge, not the career. Okay. So I, uh, particularly today, it's a little bit different. The fighters are looking at careers. Um, they have to be very smart about picking their fights. Um, and it's important to have um, a mentor, a coach, someone that you can rely on to kind of help guide you. Because um, the problem with fighters, if you're a real fighter, which is a little bit different to an athlete, um, and to be in this sport, you've got to be a combination of both a fighter and an athlete. So you've got to have that, um, I want to get in there and smack some heads, but the dedication and drive to be an athlete and train properly and prepare. Um, and it's finding that balance that is difficult. Um, my problem was, um, because I did it for the challenge, I didn't really take much guidance. I pretty much got offered anything and I took it. Like, I didn't look at the, the pros or the cons and, you know, maybe I should take it a little bit slower. Um, perfect example was um, I fought, went in the UFC. I got there, you know, the first time I fought Jeremy Horn. I won the match, submission, under three minutes. Yay, you know, I've achieved my goal. I'm good to be the king. I'm in there. I was super excited. And afterwards, I talked to my coach. And I'm like, you know, to Anthony, I said, look, this is really awesome. Uh, we've achieved something here. Um, we've got a great career option. So we're going to take things slowly. We're going to uh, pick our fights very carefully. We're going to try slowly move up. You know, we watched Tito Ortiz absolutely dismantle Evan Tanner. It was an ab like he's a beast of a champion. We're like, wow, the guy's a monster. We really want to make sure that when we get there, we really earn the opportunity uh, to fight him and make sure we can give him the best uh, challenge possible. And then, so you know, went back to Australia. Um, I'd beaten their number one contender because. Jeremy was supposed to beat me, and after beating me, was supposed to fight Tito. So after I beat Jeremy, they lost their number one contender. So the UFC started looking around for other contenders, and no one really wanted to step up and, and face Tito at the time. Um, he just he was super dominant. Everyone wanted more time. Everyone wanted to prepare. And so the UFC is calling me and going, look, the funny thing is, it's always at like 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning that I get these phone calls. So the next day, it's like a dream. Um, so the UFC calls me up and says, hey, Elvis, uh, this is Joe from the UFC. Um, we're really impressed with your first fight in the UFC. You, you submitted Jeremy. Um, you beat the number one contender. So now you're the number one contender. Uh, we're, we'd like to match you with Tito on UFC uh, 32. You're good to go. Yeah, yeah. Fuck yeah. I, I'm in. No problem. Just send me an email. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Went back to sleep. And next day I woke up and I went, shit, I had the weirdest dream that I'm fighting for the world title. <laughs> just, you just I'm said yes to the baddest man. When I got the call, he called me at like three o'clock in the morning. Look, uh, Jeremy's lost his opponent. We've got two weeks to get a replacement. Are you in? Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Just send me an email. Get into work. I'm like, fuck, I had the weirdest dream that I'm going to be fighting the UFC. Shit, I am fighting in the UFC. Oh, yeah. What it was is like I get into work, check my email, and I'm going, oh, shit, what have I done? Didn't even <laughs> check with my coach. Yeah. And I'm, like, I'm like, hey, Anthony, remember that talk we had uh, in uh, New Jersey about, you know, taking things slow and really uh, picking our opponents and being careful? He's like, yeah, yeah, no, yep, I remember that. And he goes, I've thrown it all out the window. <laughs> We're fighting Tito for the world title. He's like... Oh, well, shit happens. Let's get you ready. <laughs> yeah, I've, I took a fight with the Huntington Beach bad boy in my sleep. That's, in my sleep, yeah. <laughs> that's, oh, I sleep is, that's, that's, that's a dream that's come true. true. It was a dream come true, I guess, quite literally. So, um, so yeah, that's back in the day, it would have been fine. Um, if I had a, a manager, um, even though Langy was my coach and he kind of guided me, he pretty much let me do whatever I wanted and... Um, I think now it's one of the things I try and do for my fighters is I try and be responsible for uh, all their matches. I don't like when now promoters come hit them up directly. I tell my fighters to say, look, if a promoter hits you up, tell them you're interested, but I have final say, send it through to me so I can look at it. So if there are any issues, because um, fighters, again, you know, they have balls of steel and, you know, they get offered a match and they're going to go, you know what, I'm, I'm not afraid, I'll take it. But it's not always the smartest move. And, you know, promoters have other things 
Uh, I saw that too. Uh, other things going on um, that they, they're, they're interested in, your um, well-being is, isn't always their priority. Whereas for me as a coach, their well-being is my priority. So, yeah, I think Janae put it well. She said, Dust, you know, she's, there's a very big difference. A lot of athletes across the board in different sports, their careers due to, you know, athletes are prone to injuries, right? Like there's so many injuries and it creates, where they're trying to create a career, but really all they've got is an opportunity. So if you want it to be, because you don't know how long it is. So if you want it to be a career, you have to treat it like a career. And a lot of these fighters will take, they go, I want to be a career, but they treat it like an opportunity. And, you know, they just take, take really quick. And it, it's some, sometimes you don't have a choice. That's fair. Sometimes you don't have a choice. Yep. But Janae said it well. She said, you know, like I'm trying to create a career, which means I've got to create a brand. This is my brand. This is my company. And I've got to treat it as such. I can't just be willy nilly, you know, jumping and everything. I've got to, I've got to be serious and focused as if it's a career. And I thought that was a really nice insight into. into well, yeah, that was, I think that was one of the things I 100%. did get right very, very early on. I realized um, branding was very important. So, um, as I said, I got the nickname, the King of Rock and Rumble. Um, and I've got the finger point. So anyone who's watched, you know, fight week or seen any photos, I always go, it's good to be the King. I've got the number one finger point and where that actually came from. Again, it was just one of those opportunities. Um, I've just won my first fight in the UFC. I was super excited. I'm standing there waiting to get my hand raised by the referee. And then I look down and there's this cameraman on his knees with a camera pointing up at me and I've looked straight down the barrel of the lens. I've kissed my finger and gone, you know, pointed down the, and this stupid grin at the end of it. And then the refs put my hand up and the, the UFC saw that they, they loved it. They stuck it on the end of their video uh, game montage. Again, first Australian in a, Uf, in a video UFC video game. So another first, um, and then they stuck it on their ads over in the US. So they do this montage of all the fights and hands getting raised. And then at the very end of the montage, it's the, the finger point. So I kind of, kind of kept that with me and ran with it, uh, with the, the nickname, The King. But back in the day, I also had, uh, I used to brand myself as the world's toughest nerd. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's important to have a following and people that can relate to you. And I was an IT um, person and you know most IT people classify themselves as nerds or whatever so I, I thought it was pretty cool to kind of classify I, mean, I think Stipe's got that now I think Stipe's well, taken <laughs> well he's a fireman he could be the world's fight, toughest fireman get the hell out of my nerd thing maybe Rob Whitaker <laughs> with his gaming I don't know or, yeah, or, even, yeah, or yeah. even Izzy even Adesanya with his his uh his anime loving you know what's they, funny they can take it now the important thing is I was first so <laughs> Um, they can jump on my bandwagon all they want, you know, <laughs> not a problem at all. But yeah, as I said, you know, I discovered earlier it was very important for branding, creating an image, being consistent. I was always known as the nice guy. Um, I loved my fans. I loved interacting with them. Um, so I made sure throughout that time, you know, I, I kind of stuck with it. And the advantage was the, um, because I was the world's toughest nerd, the, the guys that actually coded the first ever UFC video games were fans of mine. Because they're IT people, they're nerds. So they actually gave me secret moves that were the, probably the, the most powerful moves in the video game back in the day. So I got cool. kind of lucky there.